reading to the Bible in a year, July 30th, Judges 13, Acts chapter 17, Jeremiah 26, and Mark chapter 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. So Yahweh gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful, and drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come, up, uh, shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Um, yeah, this is related to Numbers chapter 6. We can go back and reread that at that point to you know, kind of get the, the history of the Nazarite vow. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask where he was from, and, didn't, and he, he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to Yahweh and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man of God who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went, with, went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? He said, I am. And Manoah said, When your uh, words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? And the angel of Yahweh said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, or eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said to the angel of Yahweh, Please, let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of Yahweh said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food, but if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to Yahweh. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of Yahweh. And Manoah said to the angel of Yahweh, What is your name, so that, when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of Yahweh said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing that it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock uh, to Yahweh, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the uh, flame went upward, oh, wait, I skipped over my spot. Yep, offered it on the rock to Yahweh. Um, and when the flame went upward toward heaven from the altar, the angel of Yahweh went up in the flame of the altar. Now, Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. Then the angel of Yahweh appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of Yahweh. Manoah said to his wife, He shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if Yahweh had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son, and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and Yahweh blessed him. And the spirit of Yahweh began to stir in him in Mahanen, sorry, yeah, Mahan, Mahane Dan, between Zorah and Eshtol. Now, Acts 17. Now, this is probably one of my favorite texts. We're going to get to it a little bit further down here. 
And when we get closer to it, I'll give kind of a bit more background behind it. But it's probably one of my favorite texts, uh, easily one of the most uh, heavily marked up sections in the text itself. Just think about it carefully as we go through it. Let's begin here. Verse 1. Now when they had passed through Epiphilus and, Ap and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a, a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ, being the anointed one. This is another sign that he is the Messiah of God. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, capital J Jews again, taking some of the wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as a security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea when they arrived and they went into a Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was being was being proclaimed by Paul at Berea also. They came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, this is the important part here, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and, and devout persons, and in the marketplaces every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. This is two completely different sides. The Epicurean philosophers are ones who believe that um, you gain the most understanding of things that happen by um, uh, taking, kind of taking life by the horns, taking all that life has to offer. That is what one side, the Epicurean, believe. Then there's the Stoic philosophers. Um, some of the most famous Stoic philosophers um, issued not only just all things in general, but um, where they would refuse food given to them, um, so that they were very often uh, they homeless on purpose, so that they could uh, kind of uh, pursue all that is the, uh, the full breadth of humanity to them by um, engaging in these kind of things. It's just the two different um, kind of wide views of the things that happen, but that's why they're mentioning here the Epicurean and Stoic saying all of these philosophers were coming to him, and they were speaking to him. Uh, some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Because he's speaking in a foreign language. Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, Mars Hill, uh, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange new teachings. Now, sorry, new strange things to our ears. And we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So, why is this such an important text? If you've ever read through a systematic theology, um, well, let me go a little bit further back. 
So a systematic theology itself is largely a textbook that goes through and investigates from a systematic method, looking through piece by piece, to give us a definition of what it is that we believe as Christians. You can have a systematic um, reading for anything at all. You can have a systematic textbook on, um, say, volcanology or cosmology um, uh, or, you know, biology, what, what have you. But a systematic theology textbook is a study of God in a systematic method. And almost every single systematic theology textbook has to go through the process of explaining, or at least addressing, what is God? That's, that's the study of God, right? Theology? That's literally what theology means. So, when we look at this, we have to understand, and again, he's, he's speaking to people who don't know any of the Judeo, uh, Judeo-Christian history. They know nothing really about this Jewish God. So he's coming to them knowing that they have none of this information. So he's uh, engaging in what's called presuppositional apologetics. Uh, apologetics meaning, and it sounds like, oh, apology. Uh, literally, it's just a, a structured method of explaining something, right? And presuppositional apologetics starts off with the pre presupposition that your view is correct. It starts off with, here's the basic terms of what we're talking about. And it moves on from there. And you can see as he goes through this text, that's exactly what he's doing. He's going through piece by piece, line by line, and explaining who God is what God is. Uh, how is it that God relates to many other things? How does God relate to people? How does God relate to nations? Um, what is it that God wants from us? Because he's only got a short period of time to do this. He's speaking to people who don't know any of this um, Judeo-Christian history, right? It's not like he's speaking to just regular Jews. He's speaking to people who are, in some cases, even atheists. And so he's coming to them and speaking to them about these things openly. And this is why it's such a great reference, especially for me, to be able to read through it and see it laid out so clearly. So let's go ahead and begin. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. I want to make sure that they didn't miss one. What therefore you worship as unknown, well, this I proclaim to you. This is where he starts defining who and what God is. The God who made the world and everything in it. Remember, most of their gods were, oh, uh, our God is the God of, of uh, the wheat ingathering. Or our God is the God of uh, the hills in this specific region of an area. Or our God is the God of the, of the trees that look like this. Or our God is the God of, the, um, uh, of, of a certain type of bird, right? In some cases, yes, they had the God of war and so forth. But they had gods that were over very small things. He's proclaiming to them the same God we've read about in Scripture. The creator God who created everything. Therefore, he is preeminent above all things, including all of these lower gods that these people worship. So the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Once again, showing that he is preeminent above all of these other gods that they worship. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of the dwelling place. 
So he's not only the God of people, but he's also the God of nations, right? That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance, so their time of ignorance, that not knowing who this God is, now he's proclaiming him to them, that God has overlooked that, but now he commands people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some of the men joined him and believed, among whom were also... Uh, uh, yeah, among whom also were Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. I'm telling you, I love that text. Moving on now to Jeremiah 26. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh. Stand in the court of Yahweh's house and speak to all the cities of Judah that come, in, that come to worship in the house of Yahweh. All the words that I command you to speak to them. Do not hold back a word. It may be that they will listen. And everyone turn from his evil way that I may relent of the disaster that I intend to do to them because of their evil deeds. You shall say to them, Thus says Yahweh. If you will not listen to me, to walk in my law that I have set before you, and to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I send to you urgently, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh, and I will make this city a, a curse for all the nations of the earth. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of Yahweh. When Jeremiah had finished speaking all that Yahweh had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and, and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of Yahweh, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate, without inhabitant? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of Yahweh. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of Yahweh and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of Yahweh. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, This man deserves the sentence of death, because he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your own ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people, saying, Yahweh sent me to prophesy against this house and this city and all the words that you have heard. Now, therefore, mend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of Yahweh your God. And Yahweh will relent of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. But as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in truth, Yahweh sent me to speak, uh, to speak to you all these words in your ears. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, This man does not deserve the sentence of death, for he has spoken us in the name of Yahweh our God. And certain of the elders of the land arose and spoke to all the assembled people, saying, Micah of Morasheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and said to all the people, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him to death? 
Did he not fear Yahweh and entreat the favor of Yahweh? And did not Yahweh relent of the disaster that he pronounced against them? But we are about to bring great disaster upon ourselves. There was another man who prophesied in the name of Yahweh, Uriah, the son of Shemaiah from Kiriath Jerim. And he prophesied against this city and against this land in words like those of Jeremiah. And when King Jehoiakim, with all his warriors and all the officials, heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Uriah heard of it, he was afraid and fled and escaped to Egypt. Then King Jehoiakim sent to Egypt certain men, Ilnathan the son of Akbor, and others with him. And they took Uriah from Egypt and brought him to King Jehoiakim, who struck him down with the sword and dumped his dead body into the burial place for the common people. But the hand of Achikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, so he was not given over to the people to be put to death. Including today in Mark chapter 12. And Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower. And he leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. They took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent to them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent yet another, and him they killed. So with many others, some they beat and some they killed. And he still had one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. They were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told a parable against them. So they left him and went away. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, "Uh, Teacher, we know that you are uh, true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And the Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, that man must take, uh, sorry, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died and left no offspring, the second took her, and then he died, leaving no offspring, and the third likewise. And these seven left no offspring, and last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, and they don't believe in this. Whose wife will she be? For she had, rather, for the seven had her as a wife. And Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason that you are wrong? Because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, How God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. One of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, 
most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. And as Jesus taught in the temple, Jesus now says, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? The great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like the greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and, and this poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all that she had, all that she had to live on. And here we go. That is all the reading and all of the notes for today. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.